And I think what's really interesting is that we, we tend to look in science or the history of science as this was invented here. So germ theory comes in around the middle of the 19th century. And yes, it does. That's when scientists are talking about it. But it takes decades to trickle down for everyone to accept uh, that um, an infectious disease is not caused by spirits or miasma, bad air, um, and that it's caused by, you know, uh, microorganisms that are transmitted between human being and human being uh, via, via different routes, depending on the um, organism in question. Um, and. Uh, that was the case in the world in, in 1918. Germ theory by then was decades old, more than half a century old, but not everybody believed it. And then, of course, you've got the, this is why it's so important to understand a pandemic as both a biological and a social phenomenon. You've got the backdrop of the war. People, at least in Europe and the parts of the world where the war was, the war action was sort of concentrated. So let's say Europe and the Middle East um, were worn down by that war. They were psychologically exhausted by four years of it. And I think they were more fragile psychologically. It was easier to think this is divine punishment. This is bad air floating up from the cadavers on the battlefields of Flanders. And you see all these explanations coming up at that time. And then there were conspiracy theories, um, which, you know, sounds familiar to us. Uh, the Germans had apparently sowed it on the shores, on the Atlantic shores of the United States with their submarines landing and bringing the infection with them. Um, and these were conspiracy theories that were promulgated by high up members in the military and published in the newspapers. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's program. We are honored to welcome Laura Spinney, acclaimed author, translator, and science journalist, who will discuss her nonfiction title, Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918, and how it changed the world. The science book, written with a novelist touch, received rare rave reviews upon its publication. Masterful, remarkable, insightful, compelling, riveting, terrifying, frightening. Many such as this shared prophetic reviews. Spinney evokes a world that seems both farther from us than a mere century and also uncomfortably close. If we can't reconstruct our memories of the Spanish flu quickly enough, millions more will die in the next pandemic. It is now my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's uh, moderator, Uda Duri Akwandu, a doctoral candidate in the Department of History of uh, the, the Department of History of Science and a presidential scholar at Harvard University. She speaks widely on the subject of medicine to shed light on health disparities and social inequality. Her current research examines the intersection and construction of race, reproduction, and psychiatric health in the United States and how they undermine the concept of citizenship for Black Americans. Laura has received many awards and accolades during her brilliant career. Just recently, Prospect Magazine, in its August-September 2021 issue, named Laura one of the world's top thinkers of 20. 21. In naming her, they said, I quote, scholarly specialisms are lonely until someone, until suddenly everyone wants you, especially if you can write. Ahead of its centenary, this science journalist and novelist immersed herself in the story of the 1980 Spanish flu. Before her pale writer, it was half forgotten, despite killing 50 million people far more than the First World War. When a new pandemic arrived, she was a rare voice that could put things in some sort of context. She gives a long view on different strategies for managing pandemics and also the sometimes surprising human response from art to crime. Spinney has, been, has criticized government sloth and penny pinching, warning, we've forgotten a lot of the lessons we learned after the Spanish flu and other pandemics, and we may be about to learn them again. Uda Duri, take it away. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and welcome, Laura. Um, it really is a thank honor you. to talk to you today about this wonderfully delightful book. Um, Susan did all the positive words and I felt the exact same way as I was reading it. Um, so I guess I'm just gonna dive in. Um, I think it's undeniable that the timeliness of your book, given the fact that we are quite literally living through an ongoing pandemic. Um, and so, you know, this book was published in 2017. Um, so I want to get a, a sense of, you know, why did you become curious about the Spanish flu back then? And obviously you couldn't have predicted that we'd be in this moment, but I guess I'm curious what drew you to the subject at that time. Yeah, so um, it's a very good question because actually, obviously I could not have predicted this moment. Um, but uh, on the other hand, over the last 500 years, we have had on average about three pandemics a century. So they are much more frequent than people think. So that's the first point I wanted to make. Before I wrote this book, I hadn't really, although I'm a science journalist, I hadn't really covered infectious diseases. And the reason that I came to it was the following. About 2013, I'm a freelance, I'm a, uh, so I write for lots of different people. And with the various science editors that I write for, we were discussing how are we gonna mark the centenary of the First World War, the Great War. And so we were, because we're science journalists, we were thinking of the science aspects and I was being sent off on all sorts of really quite brilliant missions, things like battlefield archeology span and trying to understand, you know, uh, all the fields that sort of impinge on, on understanding that war. And as I was sort of doing my research, I kept coming up, up against this other disaster um, that nobody was talking about that had overlapped with the war in the world at that time. And uh, when I did my first Google search on um, the 1918 so-called Spanish flu, um, because I probably knew about much, as much about it as anybody else at that time, which is not very much at all. I came up with these amazing figures, you know, a minimum death toll of 50 million globally. And so I was like, what, you know, the, the Great War is supposed to have killed around 18 million people. Why aren't we talking about this one? And it seemed like this huge hole in our collective memory. And, and that was the genesis of the book, really, the impulse to want to fill that hole. Right. And we'll return to this question of erasure and historical memory, because um, I think it's really critical. Um, mm. This one thing I was also curious about, like, do you think anything would change if you had been researching and writing this book now in 2020? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, even then, it was a very active area of research in history of medicine, you know, trying to um, fill out the picture of the 1918 flu, because, you know, historians of medicine were very well aware that they had this biased picture where most of the data came from the the developed a wealthy world at that time, and we had very few data from the rest of the world. So there was a, a, a major effort to try and fill in that gap as far as possible and gather stories from the rest of the world. But when COVID came along, one of the sort of curious side effects it has, it had, and is still having, was to sort of spur people's interests in historical pandemics. And there've been articles about this actually, how people, um, went up into their attics to sort of find letters and old diaries where their family members talked about living through the 1918 flu because they hoped that it would shed a light on living through this pandemic. And so because of that, a lot more information has come to light that wouldn't have been available otherwise, which I think is fascinating because it shows us the sort of inner workings of history of how when a new event comes along that's similar to the others, it sort of revives those memories. So it's not a linear process at all in the way that we create memories. Um, and, uh, and so that's generating loads more primary data, which will then presumably fuel researchers to go and write more papers and books, and, and, and therefore we'll have a much better picture of the 1918 flu, which is really exciting. It is. Yeah, and I guess this point you just made about people going back into their own memories and their own sort of archival familial um, sorts of um, documents that they have really gives, gives a sense of the scope um, of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you go into great detail about the cost of human life that accompanied it. Um, do you think you can kind of provide an overview of the Spanish flu scope and reach across time and space? Yeah, so in a sort of smallish nutshell, I mean, it struck in three waves, um, which the first was in the Northern Hemisphere spring of 1918. That was a sort of mild herald wave, it's often called. The main most vicious wave was in the latter part of 1918. Um, and in fact, the majority of the people who died, died within a mere 13 weeks between the middle of September and the middle of December 1918, which is quite extraordinary when you think about it. that's that's at least 50 million 
are dead, according to the estimates that we were working with at the time, in 13 weeks. Um, so that wave receded at the end of 1918, and then there was a sort of recrudescence in early 1919. Um, we call that the third wave. Some people think it was just the tail end of the second wave, interrupted by the sort of end of year celebrations. Um, and then some people add other waves because basically it's very difficult to judge both the beginning and end of a pandemic. You know, it's a kind of bell curve. It oozes in and recedes slowly. Um, and depending on your criteria, you can define the beginning and end different, differently. But within that period of between two to three years, if you because the other part of the puzzle is that it was staggered in time over the world. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing how that happens now with COVID. But basically, there was a there was a, a time lag and the southern hemisphere was affected late with respect to the northern hemisphere. So we tend to say the whole thing was over within about two to three years, depending on where you were standing in the world. And within that time, one in three people on Earth were infected. A lot of those infections were asymptomatic. But of those, uh, we think that between 50 and 100 million people died. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot. Um, some we got a question from the audience, actually, you know, from someone in the audience trying to wrap their head around, like, at least within the United States, there was about 675,000 people that passed away. Um, in the US now with the COVID pandemic, we've currently surpassed that number. Um, mm sense of why and how that might be? I mean, given we have like newer technology, you would think more effective quarantine measures, et cetera. So, yes. So both numbers are quite unreliable, of course, but the number from 1918 is even more reliable for one very simple reason, which is that there was no diagnostic test for the disease at that time. Virus was a very, fairly new concept at the time. Um, and of course, flu is caused by a virus. So um, there were very massive diagnostic problems then. Also, of course, remember that the population of the United States was about a third then of what it is now. So relatively speaking, um, it was a much bigger death toll then than now. But yes, um, undoubtedly the death toll in the USA today is pretty shocking. Um, given that it's a wealthy country uh, with one of the most advanced uh, medical systems in the world. Um, and that poses lots of questions, um, you know, which are very complex to answer because there are many factors that go into it. But um, I suppose the first and most important thing to say is that every pandemic is caused by a novel disease. That's why it's a pandemic, because it, it encounters a human population that is completely immunologi immunologically naive to that pathogen, that disease causing agent. Um, and that's why it's so devastating. Um, you know, the flu, which we, every, every strain of flu that is circulating today and that causes seasonal flu every winter once started as a pandemic strain. Um, and so uh, th there is a sense, you know, epidemiologists like to say, if you've seen one pandemic, you've seen one pandemic. They are all different and it takes time to learn the characteristics of the new disease and of course to develop treatments and vaccines to it. And that's why in a sense, we are all always helpless to it to begin with. The question is how fast can we respond and how fast can we develop the medicines and the vaccines that we need to fight it? Right. And I think this question of like the, like a pandemic start the novel disease kind of leads us into questions about, you know, the various theories about how this particular pandemic began. Um, you know, one audience member in particular was curious about if it actually started in a U.S. Army base. Um, mm. And I think these are these sorts of questions are even, again, relevant in our own moment as we consider all these, you know, lab leak theories. Um, where did it start? Where did COVID start? Um, so I guess my first question is, could you maybe describe some of the various theories about how the um, Spanish flu began? Um, and I guess the secondary question would then be, you know, why are debates about origins important? Um, you know, mm. why do we care? What sort of stories do they tell us about our um, own commitments to this? So, I mean, the first thing to say is that um, it's it's well known as the Spanish flu. It was not Spanish. It was not any more Spanish than anybody else's, that is, because Spain was, was badly affected. So um, obviously the world was at war in early 1918 when um, uh, the pandemic erupted. And those countries that were at war um, tended to censor their press. So uh, they kept news of the epidemic within their borders out of their newspapers. So it's not supposedly so as not to demoralize 
their populations, but probably in reality not to give a hand a, more, a psychological advantage to the enemy. Spain was neutral in that war and did not censor its newspapers. So when it had its first cases in the spring of 1918, they were reported on in the newspapers, in the Spanish newspapers, and they included the King of Spain, who um, Alfonso the Thirteenth, who fell ill. Um, so he kind of made it really visible in Spain. He went on to recover, by the way. Um, and so reading their newspapers, because of course the newspapers were the main organ of news dissemination at the time, people assumed it was kind of rippling out from Madrid. We actually don't know today where that pandemic actually started, but there are three theories I'd say on the table and they correspond to origins in China, in uh, inland, Ch in, inland China, to uh, this military base um, in Kansas that your uh, questioner referred to, and also to a British military base in Northern France, um, uh, called at a place called Etape, just south of Boulogne-sur-Mer. Um, and we can't actually today choose between them. But one of the really ironic things is that until COVID came along, historians of medicine were sort of fighting over these origins, but in the reverse xenophobic way. So, so quite, quite a lot of American historians of medicine were saying, no, it started in Kansas. <laughs> and and there's, a, there's a famous British historian of medicine that's saying, no, 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 it started in my British army base in France. So, you know, I guess that's what 100 years distance on the event gives you. You know, people don't mind so much about responsibility and accountability. Of course, now it's the opposite. I mean, I think, you know, the, the link with COVID is, is, is just to say how very hard it is to pinpoint the origin of a pandemic, possibly uh, impossible. Um, and this comes back to the naming issue in a really interesting way, which is I think that as soon as you become aware that you have this problem in the world, you have to give it a name because you have to be able to call it by something. You can't discuss it. You can't start um, counting it or, or measuring it or, or proposing solutions to it until you've got something that's a name that you can discuss with, you know, that you can, that is the label for it that you share. Um, and, and, and so you have to give it a name. But of course, right at the beginning, you know almost nothing about it. Right. Um, and so the names that they attract tend to be wrong, always tend to, often tend to be wrong. Um, and, and then they stick. So that's the problem. And, and then you put in a dose of xenophobia in there too, which is always blame the other. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, and you know this is the result. You get you get naming accidents, which tend to kind of echo down the centuries. Um, but you know what's really interesting also about 1918 is that because newspapers were the main organ of dissemination of information, news traveled much more slowly. And so before, um, in the early kind of months of the pandemic. People noticed, of course, that they had local epidemics, but they didn't really yet clock that these were con that these were connected and that there was one big pandemic. And so you see this kind of reflected in different local names. So, for example, in Senegal, it was called the Brazilian flu. In Brazil, it was called the German flu. Often this was related to the boat that was supposed to have brought it that came from the named place. Um, uh, the, 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 some of them are quite funny. The Poles called it the Bolshevik disease. The Danes said it came from the South. And then gradually over time, people realized that they were all experiencing the same disease. And, and the name that stuck is the one that was being used by the most powerful nations in Earth, on Earth at that time, which are the ones that had just won the war. Mm. Uh, and so they, they managed to impose their uh, agenda. And that's why it got called the Spanish flu. Mm. Yeah, I found that element of that book extremely fascinating because I, I personally didn't even know the true origins of it. Um, but I think it was, uh, huh? I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, um, so in 2015, the WHO, the World Health Organization, came up with a set of guidelines. I mean, it, they don't call them rules because they can't don't have the power to impose them. And it would be very difficult anyway to try and guide the naming of pandemics so that we don't stigmatize places, people, subpopulations, uh, you know, we try to give it that label without, um, without um, denigrating anyone in ways that history has shown can have quite bad consequences for that per place or population, economic terms, social terms, all kinds of terms. And to a very large extent, we succeeded with that this time. You know, COVID is the sort of bland name that the WHO was hoping we would pin on a pandemic. But it all kind of started to crumble when the variants yeah. um, emerged. And then we started naming those after places. And then 
the WHO, I think, I mean, I, I'm guessing they're mainly responsible, got us sort of back on track. Now we tend to talk about alpha, delta, beta. Yeah. So there's this constant kind of arms race between the kind of uh, people who want to blame and, and the people who want to. Um, and it's not simple because, you know, sometimes there is useful information in those names. I mean, it, it, it might be useful to know where it started, you know, or what animal uh, it came from, if you know. But the trouble is, again, that you don't necessarily know for sure at the beginning. Right. And I think this question of, you know, this naming, this element of like trying to have neutral names so that we're kind of avoiding blaming and um, marginalized populations also leads me to the, another question I had about, um, you take a lot of time in your book, importantly, discussing the ways in which the flu got entangled in, you know, broader racial politics, not just within the United States, but in various different contexts from India to the US to Brazil. Um, do you mind kind of talking about the different ways that the flu got entangled with these racial politics and the consequences for particular yeah. um, populations globally? Sure. So, of course, I suppose what history teaches you is that you know, there's always a backdrop to the event that you're studying. And um, that backdrop interferes with the response to the um, pandemic then and also today in multifarious ways. So, for example, um, you know, the, the, the Great War was essentially the event that broke up the great empires. So if you can think about 1914 as those empires, those European empires being at the peak of their, their extent and powers. And so at that point, medicine was deeply colonial in large parts of the world. And what that meant was, for example, take India, which was a British colony at the time, um, you know, the British attitude was, this is slightly simplistic, but not much, that was that, you know, it was a hopeless case. India was a hopeless case. It was unhygienic. There was nothing you could do about it. And so they hadn't put in place um, um, a, a good health provision for the indigenous population. And that became blatantly obvious when the, um, when the flu erupted, on top of which the doctors that did exist were tended to be away at the front. Um, and um, the Indians had a memory of a, a recent epidemic of plague in their country that was still in living memory in which they had been very brutally treated by the colonial um, uh, powers. Uh, and essentially, um, you know, they, they were treated as being responsible for spreading this infection and for being the source of this infection. So that was very in very recent memory. And you saw that in, in parts of Africa as well and parts of Asia. And so there was a, you know, a, a completely understandable tendency on the part of these people to be afraid of hospitals, to be afraid of doctors, to be afraid of needles once, once vaccination campaigns started being rolled out. Because, and, but I'd make a side point here, which is that although virus was a new concept, vaccination was a very old concept at that time. And vaccines were made during the pandemic of 1918, though they tended to be against bacteria that were opportunistically uh, colonizing the respiratory tract and that caused secondary complications. They weren't against the virus uh, that was causing the initial infection. So they were largely useless, not completely, because sometimes they could help with that secondary infection. And most of the people who died of flu died of pneumonia caused by bacteria, but they didn't really work. Uh, they were very patchy in their efficacy when they did. And uh, anyway, they were rolled out from the autumn of 1918. And in parts of the world, you see indigenous populations refusing the vaccines um, for, in many cases, valid historical reasons. Uh, you know, in South Africa, for example, there was a, a boycott amongst black South Africans of the vaccines that were rolled out by the government that autumn because uh, until then, nobody had really cared about their healthcare. And suddenly they were coming towards them with needles uh, and with always the suggestion of blame that they were responsible for this epidemic. Um, so understandably, they boycotted it. So I think it's really, really important, we see it again today, to understand the history that different minorities bring to the crisis that's unfolding, to yeah. understand their response to it. Definitely. And I guess kind of connecting it back to our own moment again, I guess, what elements of this discourse of blame do you see kind of repeated, but in what ways has it kind of differentiated? I think, you know, in some ways, in some ways there's a focus on like vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Like there's different sorts of categories of difference in blame that are kind of emerging. 
Um, so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and how blame is kind of playing out within our own moment. Yeah, I mean, you saw it right from the beginning, didn't you? So like we, we, we knew this, there was this dangerous new respiratory infection in China. Uh, you know, there were kind of dire warnings about it from quite early on. But in the West, we basically just sat there and watched it rolling towards us and did almost nothing. And I think, I, you know, I don't know if you remember, but I remember this, at least where I am. At the time, there was this sort of feeling that, you know, the, the last country to get infected did something wrong and we won't have this problem. There was always this, 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 the other, the other, the other. The other has done something wrong. The other has done something or not, you know, responded adequately. Why, is it, why are so many Italians in Lombardy dying, you know, oh, because they live in multifamily apartments and they're, you know, relatively old, uh, you know. And, and then it comes here. Of course, we're all, you know, affected just as badly with variations, of course, because we are all different in many different ways. Um, but I think there's that abiding sense. and. Um, it's partly to do with borders. We have this sort of extraordinary belief in borders that they're going to protect us somehow. <laughs> and of course they don't. Um, and, you know, going back to 1918, uh, there, there, there was some sort of, in the late 19th century, there had been some sort of nascent thinking about how are we going to coordinate internationally to fight infectious diseases, mainly actually to facilitate trade, not to protect our populations, but to protect trade. Uh, and there had been conferences, sanitary conferences about that internationally, and there had been some organizations set up, but it was mainly about enforcing those rules, for example, on maritime trade. After 1918, there's this realization that you need international coordination. And so after that pandemic, you know, in public health terms to protect the populations. And after that pandemic, you see the kind of forerunners of the WHO being set up. The League of Nations, for example, had a health branch um, the, the WHO itself didn't come into existence until 1946, but there were these forerunners. And I think that was all about understanding that viruses don't respect borders uh, and that you have to intervene at the population level. There's no point in sort of blaming the individual or treating or even treating the individual. You need to consider this in population terms. And I guess speaking of the population, um, something else I found really interesting about your book and again, these parallels that just keep coming up. Um, there's like the perpetuation and dangers of ignorance um, in the context of, context of a pandemic. Um, and I think it was really interesting how you talked about both how this was perpetuated both by the public and those in power from you know denial of the pandemic to questionable ways of treating it. Um, so I guess, can you just kind of describe um, maybe even some examples of how ignorance kind of was perpetuated during this period? Um, and why you think maybe ignorance ignorance continues to like remain our impulse? Um, I guess it's really can... fascinating, isn't it? Because it's like it, it, it's like a litmus test of. It's, it, for me, it sort of throws a lightning bolt across the state of knowledge of the uh, and understanding and beliefs across the population. So, I mean, in a way, ignorance is the sort of default state when the pandemic erupts because you don't know anything about that disease organism, as I said, but. Maybe you, you know something about the way that infectious diseases spread in general. Maybe you know something about hygiene. Maybe you know something about the way that vaccination works. And maybe you don't. And I think what's really interesting is that we, we tend to look in science or the history of science as this was invented here. So germ theory comes in around the middle of the 19th century. And yes, it does. That's when scientists are talking about it. But it takes decades to trickle down for everyone to accept uh, that um, an infectious disease is not caused by spirits or miasma, bad air, um, and that it's caused by, you know, uh, microorganisms that are transmitted between human being and human being uh, via, via different routes, depending on the um, organism in question. Um, and uh, that was the case in the world in, in 1918. Germ theory by then was decades old, more than half a century old, but not everybody believed it. And then, of course, you've got the, this is why it's so important to understand a pandemic as both a biological and a social phenomenon. You've got the backdrop of the war. People, at least in Europe and the parts of the world where the war was, the war action was sort of concentrated. So let's say Europe and the Middle East um, were worn down by that war. They were psychologically exhausted by four years of it. And I think they were more fragile psychologically. It was easier to think this is divine punishment. This is bad air floating up from the cadavers on the battlefields of Flanders. And you see all these explanations coming up at that time. And then there were conspiracy theories, um, which you know sounds familiar to us. Uh, the Germans had apparently sowed it 
on the shores, on the Atlantic shores of the United States with their submarines landing and bringing the infection with them. Um, and these were conspiracy theories that were promulgated by high up members in the military and published in the newspapers. Um, so, you know, I, also I think there was a slightly um, maybe optimistic view at the beginning of this pandemic that we won't have that problem because we've got um, amazing methods of disseminating information these days. But unfortunately, fake news travels with real news. And of course, we've seen the fallout of that. Um, so, you know, we live in a world where information travels many times faster um, in much greater volumes. And um, yeah, I mean, can we talk about ignorance or can we talk about being misled? Because often people consider themselves very well informed but maybe the sources are not, um, you know, it, it's a complicated question, but it's one that's very much in the spotlight at the moment, of course. Definitely. Um, I guess the reverse of that, we had a question from the audience about, um, you know, I guess not ig ignorance in this case, but, you know, can you talk a little bit more about the, how the public adopted health mandates back then? Um, and I guess a related question also from the audience is, um, what sort of lifestyle changes occurred during and kind of shortly after the pandemic that maybe relate, um, that continue to remain with us today? Hmm. So um, yeah, the mandate thing is interesting. I always have to preface what I say by saying it really depends where you were in the world because everywhere you were in the world, you had a different relation to authority and to knowledge and to belief and, and, and so on. Um, if we take the example of the United States and Western Europe, you know, um, uh, those were probably the most advanced parts of the world in terms of public health at that time, although public health was, you know, relatively new concept um, in much of the world. Uh, so the idea that the authorities could intervene in your private life on health grounds was, was quite extraordinary for many people in the world at that time. Not in the United States and Western Europe. They, they had had uh, some experience of that, for example, in the fight against TB consumption. Um, so being told you mustn't spit in the streets, you must, you know, cough into a handkerchief, that kind of thing. People were used to that. It was also a time, um, importantly, before sort of civil rights movements, when people were used to a more patriarchal structure. So having, you know, uh, um, having uh, authorities that were more, so, so this is sort of the opposite of what I was just saying, people who were more invasive and intrusive in your life, and you accepted that, the to, to make the sense with what I just said now, but not on health grounds, just on, on other grounds. So they could come into your house and, you know, uh, I don't know, arrest you or whatever. Um, that, that was more not expected, but you, you, you had to put up with it because that was the, the way society worked at the time. And uh, also there was a war on. And so it got all tangled up with messages of um, patriotism. So you were, um, you, you, were uh, you know, a, a slacker, if you, um, uh, if you didn't, you know, weren't to go, go to be conscripted as a soldier, but you were also a slacker if you didn't wear a mask. Um, and these mm. messages got sort of entangled. Uh, so, you know, your duty as a citizen to protect the war effort was also to fight the flu. So it was a very different time in many ways. Um, and trust is central to all of this, of course, because people would comply to begin with, uh, do what they were told by the, th the authorities. And then over time, as they saw that actually the doctors didn't know what they were doing, had no treatments for this novel disease, and uh, people were still dying and dying in large numbers, trust, trust kind of fell off in the authorities. And then you see compliance fall off too. So there's also a sort of temporal dynamic at work here. Right. And I guess this topic of like medical authorities, it, I think it kind of naturally leads us to another question from an audience member. Um, about like the effects of the Spanish flu on, on physical bodies. Um, so I know now we kind of, we're talking a lot about like long COVID mm. and that's completely murky. No one knows what's going on with that. Um, the question is asking about if there was any studies on lingering brain, brain fog after the Spanish flu. Um, you, um, I guess apparently high school graduation rates went down. Um, did that come up in your research at all? So, yeah. So, I mean, like the state of science today is that we, you know, people who study flu understand that it's not just a respiratory disease and especially in its severe forms, it can affect all organs of the body, including the brain. We know that it can, you know, the virus can travel up the olfactory nerve and go into the brain and cause inflammation there with all sorts of 
uh, effects, including sort of stroke and, and epilepsy and, and depression and so on. Um, because there wasn't much understanding of the disease at the time or of even what a virus was, there wasn't much research at the time into the long-term consequences of the disease or any natural sort of linking of, so even when there was some documentation of kind of what probably were after effects, they didn't necessarily recognize that the cause was the flu. Um, so the data on, on those long effects is pretty patchy, um, but people have made extraordinary efforts to try and piece it together. It does look as if there was a huge wave across the world after the flu itself had passed of what they called melancholia, we would call it depression, maybe a kind of post-viral depression, lethargy. I mean, there are tales of, you know, people not being able to motivate themselves to bring in the harvest and, and therefore triggering local famines because um, a lot of people had died and then the ones that were left were sort of struck down by this, you know, terrible post-viral lethargy. Um, yeah, and when you dive into the reports and some of them, you know, have come out very recently, again, spurred by interest in COVID, you know, you do, you get many, many, many anecdotal reports of, you know, I can't, an inability to think properly, uh, muscle fatigue. Um, there have also been um, suggestions that, that the flu caused more serious conditions. So there's been a debate running since the 1920s, which is still unresolved, of whether there was a link between the Spanish flu and the, let's call it the 1918 flu, and um, an overlapping slightly later uh, epidemic or pandemic, because it was global, of something called encephalitis lethargica, colloquially known as sleepy sickness. Um, um, and this um, affected uh, more than a million people, I think, worldwide, if I remember correctly. Um, a third of them died, a third of them recovered, and a third of them went on to develop a kind of, um, uh, in, in the decades that followed a sort of a form of Parkinson's disease, which in some cases left them sort of locked in in their bodies, um, paralyzed. These are the patients that um, Oliver Sacks uh, described in his famous book, Awakenings, that, that um, was made into a film where uh, the Parkinson's drug L-DOPA was used to try and stir these patients out of their um, catatonia for once of a better word. It did work temporarily, but it, so, so that encephalitis lethargica is strongly suspected of having been caused by the flu, um, but we have not yet found, and I think this is, I'm still correct in saying this, I think I'd know if I was wrong, at the time of my book certainly it was true, there's never been flu viral genetic material found uh, in the brain tissue of those patients, encephalitis lethargica patients at post-mortem. So we don't have the clinching piece of evidence that they were linked. So the jury is still out. Um, it doesn't mean it's not there. It might mean that our measuring uh, methods are not sensitive enough, um, but those patients have all passed now. So uh, though there may be tissue from their brains still kept in archives, uh, it's possible that we may never be able to resolve that mystery. Right. It's, it's, it's so fascinating just thinking about the visible and invisible effects of um, these. And yeah, and, and of course, we, 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 we do this terrible thing where we discount the future. So we don't think about these people who are being infected, maybe asymptomatically to begin with, but who may go on to develop long COVID. And the huge toll this could have in human terms and social terms and economic terms and all sorts of terms. And, you know, I, I think it's really relevant to the whole debate about whether to get children vaccinated, because we don't know what we're doing with their future health. We don't know what long COVID might impact on them, how it might impact on them. If it does, of course, it's, it's too early to say. But um, it's not, I, I worry a little that it's not a part of the debate over that. Right. And I think this, I think this leads me to my last question before we open it up um, to the audience. But one of the lines that really struck me in your book was when you wrote, the Spanish flu is remembered personally, not collectively, not as a historical disaster, but as millions of discrete private tragedies. Why do you think that is? What are the consequences? And I guess we talked about it earlier, like, will this similar process take place in our own moment? <laughs> yeah, so um, this is a very live debate amongst memory experts now. I think it's fascinating. Um, and it comes back to what, it may come back to what information is available in the time of the pandemic, okay? So as I was saying, 
because of this poor understanding of viruses and of the disease and of perhaps the long-term consequences at the time, it's taken us a century to rebuild what happened in 1918, to reconstruct what happened there, understand the sort of shape of that pandemic. Um, and of course, we're still doing that. Today, we have a much better understanding of viruses. Um, we have this information. I mean, so if you think about it, anybody in the world who had access to the internet could, if they were so inclined, follow, track disease and death rates from COVID pretty much from the beginning in real time, practically. I mean, obviously the data was patchy, but you could watch it unfolding in real time if you wanted to, every member of the public with internet access. So the debate amongst memory experts is, this is the first major pandemic to post-date the internet re revolution. And mm. is it possible that because we have better information now in, in 2020 and 2021, that we'll form a better memory, collective memory of this pandemic than of all the ones that have gone before? Will that make the difference? And that would be so fascinating because it would mean that we would have a greater awareness of pandemics, we'd start preparing better for future ones, it would have all sorts of knock-on effects. Um, and if it doesn't happen, if we also forget this pandemic, despite all the information that we've had access to from the beginning, then that also is really interesting because it tells us something about, must be something about the nature of pandemics, which is forgettable. Something about pandemics that we just want to get past, which wouldn't be completely um, surprising either. Right. My, my <laughs> hope is that that's not the case. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, like you said, it, who knows? Um, well, I want to thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, Great question. Completely delightful. But I think now we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, I guess if the audience has any questions, please just put them in the chat. I see that a few have already come in. Um, so I'm going to start off with um, another one that's asked, um, if you have any insight about um, what might convince an unvaccinated people to get vaccinated, um, they write that wearing a mask was really big back then. What convinced people to do it back then? And do we think that it can be adopted today, those sorts of strategies? Yeah, I think this is really difficult and I don't have any clear answers. But I think, let me say a few things that might be helpful. First of all, I think from what I can gather from the data that the vast majority of vaccine hesitant people have questions and doubts, they're not adamantly against them. And so if that's the case, then in the vast majority of people, it's a question of understanding what their questions and doubts are and where, uh, where, where it's possible answering them. And remembering perhaps what I was mentioning earlier that you know, vaccination has had a kind of troubled past uh, yeah. and a violent past. And remembering that certain subpopulations, groups of our populations may remember that and may have that bring that bring that history to the present moment and that may shape their doubts and, and questions. So I think that needs to be addressed. Um, I don't know how you tackle those people for whom it is a question of personal freedom and identity um, and who sometimes it seems to me are dealing in alternative, you know, I mean, there aren't alternative facts, but it seem to be taking their source of information from a universe that I don't occupy and they don't occupy mine. So I don't know how you deal with those people. Um, I think one of the problems is the trust issues. So, you know, Anthony Fauci, where you are, is a wonderful, amazing public health leader, but maybe there should be others from different communities mm -hmm. who are spreading the message and, you know, um, being the face of, of, what is best for us all as, as personal, as individual and collective protection and generating that message. Um, I think that's a really important lesson to take away for next time. Of course, we need to do something about the misinformation too. Uh, you know, Facebook in the news again this week, um, I think we're moving towards a place where we need to understand how to regulate, that they do need some regulation, the social networks. It's not an easy question um, because often they are, you know, the counterweight to other authorities that have their own reasons for misinforming and misleading us. So we have to get the balance right. But I think this pandemic has shown, perhaps the climate change crisis, the climate crisis has shown as well that, you know, misinformation uh, unregulated on social networks can do an awful lot of harm and needs to be reined in to some extent. Definitely. Thank you. Um... I guess speaking of misinformation, um, 
did the 1918 pandemic dominate the world's news cycle as much as our present one? Did you get a um well uh so no to begin with there was massive censorship as i as i mentioned but then the the war ended um and people realized they had a major problem with the pandemic so it became more present in the news cycle um there there are certain qualifying factors to that illiteracy was much higher in the world than it is now uh, even in the wealthy countries um so not everybody had access to the news and then there was this kind of, um, it, it was a much more sort of a patriarchal society everywhere. So there was this feeling that, you know, you mustn't give every, all the information to the people because the people will panic and riot and it'll be the mob mentality. So there was a sort of a paternalistic, is the word I'm looking for, attitude to kind of, you know, protect people from the news. But as we know now, that tends to have the reverse effect. <laughs> Um, and people find out anyway, and they see around them, you know, people dying in the streets and in their, you know, their neighbors. So it tends not to work that. Um, and then, uh, you know, when in, in the peak of it, there was an even more alarming effect where, you know, um, people in the newspaper offices started falling ill and dying. And you ended up getting newspapers uh, with large empty spaces in them because there was nobody to write the stories, nobody to print them and nobody to distribute them. And then the news, you know, so it had its own impact on the news cycle as well, which must have been very alarming, I would have thought. Um, all of this has to be qualified, you know, with, with the fact that there was the war for some of it going on in the background. There was the whole reconstruction that started when the war was over. There was, you know, a, a massive interest, of course, in the peace treaty. And it was also a very turbulent time. I, you know, we, it wasn't peaceful once peace was declared. It was a very turbulent time in many parts of the world. Um, and uh, so there were many other um, distractions. And it was also a time when infectious diseases were still the main killer of people. And mm. so, you know, perhaps people's level of tolerance of when we decide we're going back to normal <laughs> uh, was different from what it is today. Right. Thank you. Um, we have two related questions in the Q&A box about um, comparing responses to the pandemic um, in 1918 versus now. Um, do we think that we learned anything from the 1918 um, pandemic? I guess this would be specifically thinking about the US perhaps. Um, did we respond better or worse? Um, I guess we're well, looking at the his looking at the past help us respond better in the future as well. I mean, there were major ways in which we learned collectively from that pandemic. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples. First of all, the whole field of virology basically takes off from the early 1920s. So a field devoted to the study of viruses which were barely known in 1918, or you know, at the moment that the pandemic erupted. And that, of course, gave rise to the understanding of many other viral diseases. So that within a few, with, by the 1930s, you've got flu vaccines that actually target the flu virus coming online. The polio vaccine is, in a way, a product of that interest in viruses. And so science has transformed. Medicine's also transformed because um, if we just stick to the West, there's a realization, as I was, you know, I referred to before, that you've got to, you've got to have a kind of population level medicine as well as an individual level medicine. And so you see socialized medicine, the concept of treating the population, um, uh, uh, which is something that had been discussed at length before the pandemic, but nobody had really acted on it. Now it starts coming into effect. Um, the first place to put that in, in, in place is Russia, uh, then uh, countries in Europe, the UK put in place its national health system in 1948. Of course, you don't see it happen in the US, but you see a different kind of recognition of the same need in the sense of employer-based insurance systems. So, you know, this idea of being insured against future health problems comes, and, and those start to proliferate in the United States uh, from the 1930s. Um, so they took a different route, but they're tackling the same problem. Um, and then of course, there are these global organizations that I referred to um, that are trying to coordinate public health campaigns globally across borders. Um, those are just some of the sort of medical um, changes that took place as a result and scientific. Right. And I guess the, the second part of that question is, do you, I guess, with our own criminal, do you have faith that we 
I mean, in your book, you kind of talk about how like it's kind of inevitable that this will happen again. Um, mm. Do you think that we'll respond better? I guess you can't predict the future, but do, do, do you have faith that maybe we'll respond better to these sorts of disasters or will this? I mean, we, we, we do learn in the long run. We do learn in the long run. So, you know, we, I mentioned some of the ways in which we learned from 1918 and some of those things are still in place. Um, but of course we, we go backwards as well as forwards. I mean, you know, the WHO is chronically underfunded uh, and uh, Donald Trump took your country out of it. Um, so, you know, there was, this, there was this kind of movement towards a more isolationist, nationalist thing going on across the world, not just the US beforehand, and this kind of uh, drain on the WHO's powers and, and resources. Um, you know, the WHO also probably needs to be reformed. That had been recognized beforehand. So I think going forward from this, we will be reinforced in our understanding of the need for an organization that fills that role, like is like the WHO, even if it's not the WHO itself. So maybe we could do better, but, you know, something needs to fill that hole. Um, you know, uh, public health experts tend to talk about um, this sort of cycle we go through of panic and complacency. So we panic when the new one erupts and then we forget about it and we go back to complacency and we don't, you know, do the things that we should do to prepare us better for the next one. Um, we, we talked about the memory issue before. Of course, these two things are massively linked. If we remember this one better because of the internet re revolution, perhaps we will take on board some of those lessons and address them ahead of the next pandemic, which is inevitable, um, and, uh, you know, make our societies more robust to it by doing things that we can do in advance. Because there are some things you can't do in advance. We don't know what that disease will be. We can't build vaccines to it in advance, but we can reduce the inequalities in our health system, in our societies, and make sure that the most vulnerable are less vulnerable. Um, and uh, so, so those are some of the lessons we should take on board. Thank you. And I guess the last question I kind of asked, we we focus a lot kind of on the, you know, the medical consequences. Um, but I guess you also take some time in the book talking about some of the political and cultural um, mm. consequences. Um, can you describe some of those? Um, yeah, so maybe because we talked a little bit about, you know, um, how racial issues got tangled up and all of these things. Um, and I mentioned India and South Africa. I mean, there's a, you can kind of glean from the history books that this fed into, it kind of fueled the already existing movement for independence. So there was a kind of anger amongst indigenous Indians about what had happened to them and how badly they'd been neglected. Um, and I think it fueled that independence movement. Uh, and I kind of go to great pains in my book to trace out the links between that anger and how Gandhi, who was the head of the independence movement at the time, um, he didn't have any grassroots su support at the beginning in 1918. And then after the pandemic, he does. He has this kind of wellspring of support. And I think that there's a good argument that was fueled in part, at least by the pandemic. In South Africa, you see a different thing happening. And of course, everything is highly context dependent. That's, you know, that goes without saying. In South Africa, there had been talk before 1918 of segregation along color, uh, along color lines of uh, cities and towns. Nobody had acted upon it. After the pandemic, the first law comes into place that segregates towns along color lines. And that's the beginning essentially of apartheid, which won't be overturned for another 60 years. So, um, you know, again, other factors were already in place to cause that beforehand. Uh, but I think that the pandemic fueled it and it fueled it because um, whites blamed blacks for the illness. By the way, blacks blame whites too, but they were probably more right. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, nobody knew. The point was there was this blame game going on and that it fueled that desire to divide towns. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, this has been such a riveting conversation. Um, <laughs> more. Um, I think Susan is coming back on. Yeah. Well, this was uh, just so wonderful. So, Laura, thank you. We This has just been such an honor to um, have you grace the stage of Ford Hall Forum. As I think I may have mentioned, this is the oldest continuously operating free lecture series in America. 
So we have entered our 113th year. So you join the list of uh, notable uh, thought leaders who have joined um, the list. Um, So thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Uh, Thank you. You're honored to. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, um, Udo Dury. Thank you so much for your stellar uh, moderation. Uh, what a wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you for our co-sponsor and production partner, GBH Forum Network. Thank you to the Lowell Institute for your continued support uh, to make programs like this available. 